economics and uh, long-term impacts of early childhood programs for something over 30 years now. And um, the focus of my work currently is on how do we produce large and sustained impacts at scale? Uh, both to improve the learning and development and the life course for kids generally, but also as a means of, of reducing uh, educational, social, and economic inequality. All right? So it's not just about lifting everybody up, it's also about closing gaps. Um, so, um, I want to give you a little bit of background about where I, how I get to that question, and then talk about two new studies that we've done at the Institute that, that address the question in different ways. Um, and so, <clears throat> I think the first thing uh, is to think about, well, what are reasonable goals? What is it that we would like to accomplish? with early childhood programs in the first five years. And I think the first thing is to substantially enrich children's lives in the first five years. It is, it's not just a means, not just an instrument to produce some long-term changes in their learning and development. We actually care about kids having good lives for the first five years. Um, I think beyond that, having broad improvements in their abilities at kindergarten entry, we know that essentially half the achievement gaps that we worry about um, are there before kids ever walk through the kindergarten door. Um, to do this as a means of improving their academic and social success, uh, to, as I've already said, to decrease inequality and from an economic perspective, we're interested in doing this in ways that are efficient and generate benefits in excess of costs. So, uh, I started my work on this with the Perry Preschool Study. Perry Preschool Study is a randomized trial that began, it began in 1962. It's very small, 128 kids. Uh, across five waves, so it's not 128 kids in one year. Um, I did not start the Perry Preschool study. I was in elementary school myself. Uh, but I, I had the privilege of starting the work on this at the age 19 follow-up, which is really when the first time we have a complete preschool through the end of high school record. Um, not just of academic achievement, but of um, social and, and economic outcomes. Um, it's a half-day preschool program in the public schools at ages three and four. There are weekly home visits that are mostly about one-on-one -on -one tutoring with the kid, not, I mean, yes, it's supposed to demonstrate things for the parents, but whether or not that works, the one-on-one -on -one tutoring with the kids, um, we've known since at least Bloom's work is about one of the most effective things we can do. Strong supervision and continuous improvement. I'll talk a little bit more later about what those mean. Um, and so uh, I think people basically know the story. On the cognitive side, um, there's a lot of talk about fade out, and it's true. Here I use the PPVT as a marker for IQ, um, but you could do, you could put up data for the Stanford Binet, and, and the, we would look identical. Right? I think one of the, for me, one of the eye openers about what the PPVT actually measures was using it in a study where we had also Stanford Binets and other. Braven matrices, uh, all sorts of IQ tests, and seeing how the patterns across all of them were quite similar. And you can see the pattern on achievement tests is quite different. 
So the idea that the cognitive gains fade away is an artifact of focusing on IQ. If you look at what can kids actually do academically, what are their achievement test scores, um, you've got effect sizes of you know roughly 0.3 through the in, into high school. Um, now, there are broader impacts. Um, there was a decrease in special education placements. Um, this increase in achievement persists on some measures to age 19. Um, they were more likely to graduate from high school if they went to preschool. They were less likely to be involved in delinquency and crime as measured both by self-report and criminal justice system records. Uh, they were more likely to be employed and they earned more money. Uh, my job as an economist was to put dollar values on that. As an order of magnitude, the benefits are roughly 10 times the cost in discounted net present value, which basically means how much would we have to pay you the day you walk through the preschool door to, it, for you to put that money in investment and generate the same stream of returns? And the, the idea is about an order of magnitude more than the preschool program cost. Um, so half a century later, <laughs> right, from when this was all started, uh, what do we know about preschool impacts at scale? Well, on, on average, they're very small. They're highly variable. Sometimes they're near zero or even negative in follow-up. Uh, and the most discouraging examples of this for me are the Head Start and Early Head Start National Randomized Trials, which basically find no persistent impacts. Um, the Tennessee Randomized Trial, which finds a negative impact. Um, and Quebec's Universal Child Care Program, which had negative impacts on kids. Um, so this is not what we envisioned would result from public policy. Is there a question? Yeah, I was just wondering, so for those, are you thinking about, are they thinking about life outcomes or, or test scores? Actually well, well, so it's a good question. Most of this is about test scores, but there are no differences that persist on any of the other outcomes either, right? So. No persistent differences on grade retention or special education placement. No persistent differences on behavior. No persistent differences on social and emotional measures. Across the board, in these studies, there's basically nothing. Okay. Um, and, uh, and it's true across a, a range of a variety of different types of cognitive measures, not certainly not just IQ tests or even achievement tests. And, and this is basically the pattern you see, right? This is, this is a summary of 67 of the more rigorous studies. Um, right, here's the same kind of graph for, for Head Start, but you could take social and emotional measures, you could take measures of behavior, you would see the same thing. Does that include like crime outcomes later in life? Well, <clears throat> unfortunately, we don't have any measures in these studies of the crime outcomes. However, the things that we do have measures of in the studies where we have long-term impacts on crime, delinquency, are predictors of that, right? So you can predict, um, let's take the Perry Preschool study as an example. Teachers' ratings of kids' <coughs> behavior in the first three grades predict their involvement in crime from age 15 on. If you don't see anything different in their behavior early on, it's, I don't believe in sleeper effects, basically. I think sleeper effects are basically where the researchers go to sleep and <laughs> measure something later. 
And it's only because they didn't measure the right developmental indicators early. That, you know, so if you didn't measure social behavior, if you didn't measure your ability to get along with other people, if you didn't measure your ability to think before you act in the early years, then, yeah, your test scores are not likely to predict whether you get involved in crime or not. Well, a little bit, but not a lot. Not like whether you get in fights at, as in an elementary school or you lie, cheat, and steal. Um, those are pretty good predictors of later behavior. Um, this is not a mystery. Right, so here's a map of the United States. We took all of the Head Start classroom observation data. Um, the Head Start office gave it to us, every Head Start in the country, and we graphed it by state, which is not something that people usually do because it's a federal program and states don't have any control over it, at least not directly. Um, and this is on instructional quality on the class. We set a threshold of three. I think it, that's actually a pretty low threshold. Um, and you can argue about what the threshold ought to be. Um, it wouldn't really change the picture because it's a low threshold. And so the dark red states are, are states where we can be confident that, that Head Start is below that threshold statewide. The light red states are where it's below the threshold, but the confidence interval encompasses the threshold. The light green, they're above the threshold, but the confidence interval is sufficiently large, they could be below. So it's only those, only Vermont and Kentucky, where we can be confident that Head Start surpasses a threshold that we that would expect you to have to meet in order to produce substantive gains in kids' learning and development. Well, so why don't we have lasting gains from Head Start? Well, that would be the first place I would point. And, and Head Start's some of the better programs that we have. Right? So it's not like state pre-K, by and large, is better, and it's certainly not the case that private programs in childcare are better, they're worse. I don't know of any data set that lets us do that. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the efforts to look within the, the national randomized trial by quality um, have not been particularly fruitful. But you could see there's not a lot of variation. Right? That's part of, the, part of the problem. I also think that the counterfactual likely varies in parallel. Right? The, so that, um, you know, when, when you, in 1962 when they're doing the Perry Preschool study, the counterfactual is very, very clearly being at home. It's not being in another program. That world is gone. Right? So, um, that gets me to the what explains today's results. Well, the first thing is, I think it wasn't reasonable to think that we could all run a four minute mile because someone did. Right? So, outliers are not reproducible on a large scale. Another way of thinking about this, the studies that are famous today from 50 years ago, there's a certain amount of selection bias that's gone into their identification and continued support and recognition and citation over 50 years. The Perry Preschool was not the only experimental preschool program launched in the early 1960s. Right, so I'm not, I'm not, I think qualitatively the impacts of the study hold true. But to expect results of that magnitude, even from doing the exact same thing in the exact same circumstances, I think is um, just not very scientific. Um, 
The population today starts off at a higher level than in 1960. Life for the disadvantaged has mostly improved. Um, Non-disadvantaged children that are <coughs> served in these programs, remember something like the Perry Preschool targeted very disadvantaged kids. You don't expect to get, if you don't have a problem, you can't fix it. If the kids are not going to be held back in school or drop out, you're not going to have an impact on being held back in school and drop out. Right? So the, these, this populations, the population served that we're looking at has changed. As I already mentioned, the counterfactual has changed. There are many other services for kids. Um, so lots of kids in the Head Start control group go to other programs including state pre-K that may be in some places at a higher standard than Head Start. Why would you expect Head Start to have a positive impact over that? Um, and it's, if you're looking at state pre-K, a bunch of the kids that don't go to that go to Head Start. Um, schools invest more today than in the past in catching kids up. No Child Left Behind is all about doing that. And schools aren't just failing in this. They are succeeding in catching kids up. I try to explain to people that the reason that we have all those savings in education costs from investing in preschool is because we're not spending all that money on catching kids up. But it doesn't mean that we didn't succeed in catching kids up. It's just that we didn't spend the money. Right? So there, in, in some sense, the, the big economic returns and what's sometimes called fade out, and I would rename catch up, are two sides of the same coin. They're not, uh, they're not in opposition. They're actually the same thing. Um, then I think we have a big problem with design failure. So the Perry Preschool program had two very highly trained teachers paid public school salaries, very strongly supported, immersed in less daily lesson study and planning and development with really smart people who knew a lot about child development and education. Um, who only had 12 to 13 kids between the two of them who could go to their homes each week. And then we want to know why programs with a teacher who's got minimal qualifications, very little support, a lot more kids, and can't ever get to the kids' homes, doesn't produce the same results. Um, I don't know why people have that question. Right? To me, we are designing for failure in many of our public programs. So if you don't replicate the program, you're not going to reproduce the results. Um, and finally, we have a big problem of implementation failure. This is a huge problem in education generally. Um, we don't plan, we don't analyze, we don't review, inform, or coach for continuous improvement. And so we have a big, big implementation problems and it's not just in preschool. So um, we looked at eight different state pre-K programs um, from 2004 to 2015, depending on the state. So it's over quite a period of time, quite a range of different kinds of states, um, quite a range of spending on their programs. The, the ratios, class sizes, not so different. Um, some of them are full day, some of them are half day. Um, teacher education was mostly on the high end for pre-K programs. Um, some of them were means tested, some of them were open to the general population. Right? New Jersey's program is, is a little odd in that it's the resort, resort, result of a court order uh, so it's universal, but in 31 districts with high concentrations of poverty. 
Now in New Jersey, a high concentration of poverty is more than 40% of the kids qualifying for free lunch. Nationally, more than 40% of the kids qualify for free lunch. So, exactly how disadvantaged these communities are. Some of them, they're 90%. It's not 40, right? That's the threshold, though. Um, demographics vary from 95% white in West Virginia to 95% non-white in New Jersey. <coughs> Um, three of the states, the population served majority Hispanic. That's very different from the older studies that would have been majority African American. New Jersey starts, the kids in New Jersey start off by far at the lowest level in these urban centers of concentration poverty, um, with, followed by California and New Mexico, which happen to be the states with the majority Hispanic populations. South Carolina and Arkansas kind of in between. A state like West Virginia, the average kid is almost about average in terms of their abilities when they enter the pre-K program. Outcome measures. Um, so I'm going to talk about long-term results in New Jersey. I want to give you a preview of those measures as well. In the short-term studies, we did a regression discontinuity design based on age. I'll talk a little bit more about what that is. Um, we used the Peabody, Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test, PPVT. Um, it's just a, a test of uh, oral language or vocabulary. Um, for math, we used Woodcock-Johnson. For literacy, we used measures that are really mostly about print awareness until the kids get older. Um, and uh, for the fourth and fifth grade results in New Jersey, we're actually using the statewide tests that every kid in the state of New Jersey takes for language arts and literacy, math, and science. We also look at grade retention and special education placements. So, um, methodology. In the, the, trying to figure out what are the impacts of these programs at kindergarten entry, uh, we face a challenge. We face a challenge in New Jersey where, so if it's a universal program, what's your comparison group? In West Virginia, it's a universal program. What, where do you get your counterfactual? Right? And, and the, the notion behind the regression discontinuity based on the age cutoff <coughs> is at the, the age cutoff for school entry, which side of the line you fall on is essentially random. Right? It's not been manipulated or controlled. Um, and in general, if you move out from there, the, the decision about whether you were, got to go to preschool or not in the last year is based on your age. And so the kids who go and the kids who don't go, other than age, ought to be equivalent in their family background characteristics. Right? So we're trying to deal with the selection bias problem if we just looked at who didn't go and who did go, when either who did go is based on eligibility, eligibility criteria tied to your personal or family characteristics, or it's universal and some people opt in and some people don't, for reasons. Um, so, um, we do a, a wide range of analyses, some of them are graphical, right? We just plot the data and look to see is there a discontinuity at the age cutoff? Does the distribution of, of scores on the test jump at the, just looking at the picture, right? We also do a variety of statistical analyses that control for characteristics of the kids, control for the school district they're in, um, and we do this in various bandwidths, moving out from three months to six months to the entire year. Um, we use an instrumental variables approach. 
and multiple imputation to control for misassignments and missing data. Everybody doesn't follow the rules. Um, and, um, and we do a kind of meta-analysis across the, the eight states to figure out who's really different from each other. Um, there's a lot of assumptions engaged in this. I'm not going to go into all of them. They're in the paper. You have to do a lot of tests to figure out the extent to which it's plausible they hold. Um, but they incl include checking for differential attrition, right? These are two different age groups contacted at, at different times. Um, you could have floor and ceiling problems with your tests because one group is older than the other, right? And that's confounded with treatment. Um, and there are a variety of other problems. It's not like there are other regression discontinuity designs. It, this is a relative. You ought not to think of it as the same thing or, or you kind of go down the wrong path. Um, so this is an illustration of what the outcomes look like um, for, for a lot of the states. So this, so this is just nonlinear fitting of, of the data. Um, question on the methodology. So if someone doesn't need the cutoff, can they go the next year? Can they qualify next year? Yes, the which is why you can only do it at kindergarten entry, right? So you're comparing scores at the end between kids who are just entering pre-K and kids who are just entering kindergarten. After that, all bets are off. That's the only point at which this tells you anything about the difference between the groups. You can't follow them. Right, which is why in New Jersey we use this as a method to try to uh, take care of selection bias and get what's the immediate impact. And we use another method to look at long-term outcomes because this won't work. Right. But, you know, we're, we're, you have decent, what look to be decent effects. You, it, you can see pretty clearly just from looking at the data that the, the distributions are different. Um, right, so there's language, there's math, um, there's literacy, and you can see uh, in Michigan, oh, we got a problem with the f floor um, for the younger kids. Um, there are other states that use a different assessment where you, there's an obvious ceiling for the older kids. They've just all learned what's on the assessment and they're not going to go any higher. Yes? I just, I, I want to better understand the methodology. So, so, can you state precisely uh, one more time the two groups that you're comparing? Sure. There's a, there's a, so, so, there's a, so there's a group that enters preschool, yeah. followed through to kindergarten, and at kindergarten entry, you now compare the next group of kids who are just starting the same pre preschool program. So they both selected into the same program. Okay. When you look at the scores of the preschool kids the next year? Right. N no. You, you, when you get scores that year when they're... Okay. Right. And, and the idea is at the age cutoff, right, the kids are virtually the same age. The only difference is, because I'm a day older, I've been, I got to go to preschool a year before you did, right? And even though we're virtually the same age, if my scores, right, that's why this cutoff matters so much, right? That's where we want to see the, the, the jump, because we're not very different in age. One of us got a year of preschool and one of us didn't. Just below the age were, were they just at home for that year, most of them? Nope. They, they have other, the, they go to other preschools. In New Jersey, it's complicated. Preschool starts at three. We're doing this for four-year-olds. So most of them are going to the preschool the year prior. These guys have already had the year prior. So what we've estimated in New Jersey is 
for the most part, the effects of a year of preschool at four contingent after on having already had a year at three, which is different than in every other state. I also think that uh, because for a lot of kids over here, who, they're going to private programs or Head Start, and Head Start doesn't have an age cutoff in the same sense. That is, whenever you turn four or three, you can enter the program. It doesn't have to be a September birth date cutoff like for public schools. So I think the counterfactual actually changes with age, which is very confusing. Right? And I think the counterfactual around the cutoff probably is less about the um, treatment, no treatment than it is if you look at an average effect across the entire age span. Uh, and if that were true, then you would see um, the effect sizes shrink as you shrink the bandwidth, and then it doesn't exactly work that way. So um, the counterfactual may be fairly weak in terms of its impact on kids, at least in these states. Right, so, so here's the average effect size across the eight. Um, if you, you look at language, it's about 0.25, quarter of a standard deviation. It's about a half a standard deviation for math. It's a, about a full standard deviation for um, literacy. And you can see that um, there's not actually a clear pattern of it getting smaller as the bandwidth shrinks. Um, that's actually fairly stable. Now it gets more complicated if you start looking at um, the states individually. All right, so part of it is we don't have super huge sample sizes in states. And I think that creates some instability. And so I think the state averages across are more stable, in just partly because of that. Um, and we had a problem with data collection in California, which went on for a very long time. And it, it matters if you only look at data collected in the fall uh, a lot, right, on this, on language. So you get very different answers depending on that, which is not comforting um, in terms of how robust is this to problems with our methodology, all right? Um, and you can see there's a lot of variation across states and in, in, in New Mexico and South Carolina and California using fall data. The, those impact estimates are pretty close to zero. Um, and they're certainly not as large as in the Head Start Impact study, for example. So, so from that, I would conclude there are state pre-K programs um, that are not as effective as Head Start. There are others where the estimated impacts are, are at considerably larger. Right? And I don't exaggerate. I think Head Start effect sizes on PPVT are maybe about 0.15. Um, so, but you can see some of them are considerably larger and some of them it's robust with respect to bandwidth. So, so there's variation in this. Uh, and if we look at math, um, you can see variation across the states in that as well. It's hard, as I'll, you know, I'll just preview, it's hard to interpret because you can't be sure how much of the variation across states is due to variation in the program versus variation in the counterfactual and the population, right? So if there are treatment by population contexts, interactions that are driving this, there's no 
there are not enough degrees of freedom with eight states to figure that out. And then if you look at um, literacy outcomes, they're all big. Um, they're all about a standard deviation or sometimes much higher, except for New Jersey. But then New Jersey is contingent on being the one state where most of the kids already had a year of the program. Right? So maybe for such a shallow domain, um, <coughs> there wasn't that much more for them to learn the second year. But it's also possible that New Jersey's not much oriented toward producing this impact as opposed to others. Um, I'm going to skip this. This is uh, the basic point of this chart is there's an earlier five state study that includes five of these states and it has somewhat different conclusions and the question was are the differences in conclusions due to the addition of three more states or to difference in the methodology and the answer is probably more to differences in methodology than um, in the states. So, summarizing across these uh, stable average effect sizes, there is a clear pattern across these domains. Uh, individual state um, results are sensitive to methods including the functional form. Michigan is the only state in the meta-analysis um, with, sig with significantly above average impacts in all three domains. But there is one, right? Um, and New Mexico is significantly lower on, on language and math. Um, I think it's noteworthy that except for South Carolina, it is by far the lowest spender. And the only reason South Carolina uh, doesn't, isn't, at the bottom statistically is because the confidence intervals are big, the point estimates are dismal, and they wouldn't even let us test math in South Carolina because they said that wouldn't be fair, we don't do math. So I, I think giving them a point estimate of roughly zero on math is probably fair. Um, the um, <clears throat> New Mexico um, scored clearly below average on literacy. Uh, I've already pointed out possible reasons for that. So now I want to talk a little bit more about New Jersey um, because we use this methodology to estimate immediate impacts and then we use another methodology as the program was scaling up before it reaches full implementation of universal coverage to get a comparison group who didn't go to preschool and control is for family demographics and context as much as possible to use that as our counterfactual in longitudinal study. Um, New Jersey's program is a result of a court order in a case called Abbott versus Burke. It is a momentous court case. It's a court case in which our state Supreme Court ruled the Constitution entitled every child to an education that would prepare them for full participation in the social, political, and economic life of our state. It's a very high bar. They concluded kids entering kindergarten 18 months behind in their language abilities would not get there. They did not rule that high quality preschool was a constitutional right but they basically told the legislature, if you don't do it, we will rule that. It's kind of interesting how court cases are more nuanced maybe than just what, you gotta read the rulings in some detail to figure out what's really going on. So, um, because our governor at the time failed to implement the decision, the court actually got pretty specific about the program. Uh, this is a program where we set very high expectations for kids and teachers. 
uh, with adequate funding that comes from the state and the funding is driven by the development of the program and then asking the question what's that going to cost to achieve the goals that we want not by setting some figure and saying what can we get for that which is the typical way it works in education not the reverse um, strong teachers so every teacher had to have a four-year college degree and an early childhood certification and they're all paid at the same rate as their public school colleagues in K-12. Um, so basically we doubled their pay, sent them to school, got them degrees, not in that order. Right? So they, they went to school, got the degree, and got their pay doubled. Um, we didn't have an early childhood certification in our state when the court ordered us to have every teacher certified. The, the advantage of that was we could create one that made sense and was based on our expectations for what kids should learn and teachers should be able to do. Um, maximum class size of 15 with a teacher and an aide. It's two years beginning at age three. It's full day and initially with wraparound child care provided through the child care subsidy system. Um, there are a variety of other kinds of supports and there's a continuous improvement system. Um, basically, continuous improvement system, which we teach to three and four year olds, is called plan, do, review. The version for adults is not a lot more complicated than that, right? So you set your standards, you measure and assess your progress, you analyze and plan, you implement and plan improvements. We do this in this program at every level, from the teacher in the classroom who has her own self-assessment, one coach for every 15 teachers to the level of the district to the level of the state. Right? So every district has a self-assessment validation plan. The validation part is because you don't just get to decide for yourself whether you've done as a district a good self-assessment. So there's a variety of tools. I've listed some of them here to enable this to happen. Right? I've just talked about some of them. And what did we get? Well, the first thing is like 70% of these kids were already in some kind of preschool or child care program. Right? The problem was they weren't any good in terms of support for learning and development. So this is the early childhood environment rating scale, one to seven. A um, bunch of you know that, the Eckers, all right. Um, so one is completely inadequate. Below a three, I tend to think you're actually harming kids. Um, seven is the top of the scale and excellent. Um, so the, the blue bar is what we had in 2000 when, before we had a governor who would implement the program. The red bar is progress. The green bar is 2008. So this is the, from blue to green is the period of our study. Um, we have kept moving this distribution, right? So we've moved the distribution of quality from poor to mediocre to good to excellent. Basically, we don't allow poor quality to exist, right? Two-thirds of it's provided by private providers in contract to a district. If after a certain period of time your quality is low and your kids aren't learning, you're fired. We don't fire teachers, we fire management. Somebody else can hire the same teachers. We don't care. But, but why is there no poor quality? It's not allowed to exist. It's kind of an interesting model for education more generally, I think. Um, and many of these are the same teachers, right? Who the, their practice was transformed through education, better pay, working conditions, and coaching. So what do we get? Um, I'm going to show you pictures that will make this easier to understand. But the, the first thing is, so these are the regression, discontinu got regression discontinuity estimates. Those are what are no treatment comparison group. 
I mean, not no treatment in the sense of they didn't get anything, but that they didn't go to the pre... It's kids who went to the preschool program compared to kids who didn't of the same age. That's the second line. And so one question is, are we going to overestimate the impacts of the program by doing this alternative method? Is it going to be... Because it's not as good at controlling for selection bias. So what kind of selection bias are we going to have? Well, this comparison suggests that the selection bias is negative, right? That we're underestimating the impacts of one year of preschool. Right? Across the board. Right? So that's the main thing to take from this chart. That we have some confidence because we've done the regression discontinuity design that our alternative methodology for the longitudinal study is not giving us answers that are biased upward. In fact, it looks like they may be biased downward. So, what do we find if we follow these kids? And by the way, they're intermediate where we directly assess the kids at second grade. The results look the same. These are when the kids get to the state assessments at fourth and fifth grade. Um, and so, kind of consistent pattern of larger effects from two years than one. Yep. Steve, sorry, but what, can you talk a little bit more about what your longitudinal design is? All right, so, so these are kids who, who we pick up at kindergarten entry, some of whom we know went to the preschool program and others who didn't. And they're from, so, and we analyze the data controlling for everything their parents would tell us about them and for essentially district fixed effects. So we're only looking at differences within school districts, which are contiguous with, their, with cities in New Jersey for at least for these 31. Any other questions? I'm used to talking to policy audiences, so I skimp on the methodology. <laughs> they don't want to know. Right? Um, the, um, so, um, you probably don't remember the Perry Preschool impacts in the early elementary grades, but these effects of two years are not that far off. Grade retention and special ed. Right? It's not magic, but think about in an entire city, if you move the percent of kids in special ed from 17% to 12%, what that means. If, you, if, the number, if the kids repeating grade reduce from almost 20% to close to 10%. These are really big differences at scale. And if we think about, so, so where would this fall? So I just graphed about every study of state pre-K I could get that had long-term outcomes, by which I mean something past kindergarten. <laughs> so not necessarily very long-term. And, and the little circles are telling you where the um, Abbott pre-K program is. So it's not alone, right? So North Carolina getting some impacts in the same range. Um, Arthur Reynolds Child Parent Centers getting impacts about the same. Um, there's a couple of Washington State studies. Um, they're a little more dodgy in terms of methodology. I'm not sure I believe them. But you can see there are lots of other places that, that don't. Right? And this is Tennessee. And, and by the way, some people think, well, they used a randomized trial and you didn't, so that explains it. And that's just not true. Right? There's a, there's a study that was conducted several years before the randomized trial 
using the same method that we use in our longitudinal study in Tennessee, and it finds the exact same pattern of impacts. Tennessee is the one state where kids do worse later on if they went to preschool. And it doesn't matter whether you use a randomized trial, you can just grab the state data and control for family background characteristics and find exactly the same thing. Something weird is going on in Tennessee. I don't know whether it's the preschool program or whether it's what they do in K-3. Uh, all right, so there are some lessons here for design. Right? Initial gains have to be big and meaningful, um, by which I mean more on things like math and oral language and less on things like counting and letter recognition. Uh, structural features, the resources are necessary, but they're not sufficient, right? Some of these, in, in our study, the, the states that clearly spent less than the others didn't do as well. But it's not clear that New Jersey does better than Michigan. Um, and states like Tennessee can spend roughly the same amount of money and get horrible results. Um, design has to include, I think, features that relate more directly to practice. Um, so like coaching teachers in specific curriculum. Um, program features influence quality and outcomes jointly, not independently. Right? If you were to look at any of the characteristics I listed for the New Jersey program and do a uh, regression analysis of what's the effect of a teacher having a BA degree holding everything else constant, you wouldn't find anything because they're not independent, they're interdependent. It's, it's the, the set of program features together that produce results. You can't just like pick one of them. Um, Cost ought to be driven by design and not vice versa. If we drive design from what we're willing to spend without paying attention to what's necessary to get the outcomes we want, we won't get the outcomes that we want. Um, what design works probably depends on what else happens before and after. Every year of a kid's life matters. Preschool is not magic. Um, and design needs to build in some kind of implementation GPS. I think programs like Michigan, programs like New Jersey succeed because there is a continuous improvement that's like a GPS. What do I mean by that? Right? The GPS keeps us from arguing about who got us lost. It tells us where we are and gives us step-by-step -step directions to get where we want to go. Right? Most Pre-K systems do not have that operating at the level of a teacher, administrator, district, state. Um, so what are we going to do if we want to produce large and persistent gains? I think we have to aim high with intentional teaching. We have to focus on the unconstrained domains. We need to have a substantial amount of individualization one-on-one -on -one and in small groups. We need a strong curriculum with specificity. We need to deliver a big dose. Obviously, this is not based on just the studies I presented, right? So for example, the emphasis on intentional teaching one-on-one -on -one in small groups comes out of a meta-analysis that we did of every preschool study since 1960. So, how do we translate this to policy? How do we avoid design and implementation failure? I think the first thing is not to overpromise. Um, let's be realistic in what we think we can achieve. And at the same time, we need to set higher <laughs> expectations for kids and teachers and programs. Design based on these goals and recognize that research is only going to provide a very limited basis for policy and practice. Uh, and that's why we have to have some kind of GPS in place, some kind of continuous improvement to guide policy and practice because research is never going to be good enough to do that for a specific teacher, for a specific city, for a specific state. Thank you.
questions?